All right. Uh, as uh, Jerry said, this is uh, a little bit uh, of a feature that we've run every year for several years. We have our three distinguished speakers who you've heard from two already. Our, our third, uh, Ron Ross, will be giving the closing keynote. Uh, and I'll give more of an introduction to him then. But uh, he's a fellow at NIST, uh, security expert of uh, great renown. He's been inducted in the Cybersecurity Hall of Fame. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly, if you've read any NIST 800 documents recently, uh, he has the credit, none of the blame, uh, for producing those. Yeah. So uh, the idea here is a fireside chat is I'm going to at least kick off with a few questions to get their responses for you as the audience. And then as time permits, with a hard stop at 3 o'clock, um, we are going to invite questions from the audience that they can also respond to, to give their unique perspectives. So uh, the one that I've got a couple that I want to start with, and, and one is in the area of uh, the growth of the field internationally and uh, issues of trust. So uh, we have, for a long time, sort of viewed the internet and much of the development of computing from a US-centric perspective. But it is clearly an international business. Uh, huge uh, uh, commerce that uh, crosses borders, communication, entertainment, uh, a lot of information passage that goes across borders with knowledge, growth, and sharing. And we are seeing a greater concern over trust in the communication and the, the uh, uh, equipment and the protocols that are being used across borders with greater apparent, greater uh, involvement by various nation states and lack of prosecution of actors within some of the borders because they appear to be carrying out some nation state objectives. What do you think is going to be the future of our ability to trust this computing infrastructure internationally? Or where should we be trending uh, to be able to have the confidence to, to base our uh, international level of trust? I'll start. I'll, I'll throw myself on that grenade. Um, you know, frankly, I think we're at an inflection point where the future is really, really cloudy on this one right now. Uh, my Jedi skills are not very good uh, in looking at the future of this because, frankly, as we take a look at elements of privacy, access to markets, just access to information, um, the fact that many uh, countries do not uh, view law the same way we do and give refuge to folks that I would consider as miscreants, uh, you know, internet miscreants, really are providing a lot of stress points. I, I do believe that diplomacy is uh, going to be one of the main items that we need to invest in in regards to this, uh, this issue. However, uh, there are still many uh, folks out there who view internet access as a sovereignty issue just as they would spectrum access or access to airspace or maritime or, or ground access. And I don't think that we have consensus throughout the United States on how to uh, uh, attack this issue, SPAF, but I think that diplomacy is the, the way that we're going to have to address this as our first and foremost avenue of approach. So, so you don't, be, before having the others answer, so you don't necessarily buy into a Senator Sensenbrenner's uh, statement that the, uh, the internet is voluntary. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it, right now it is so ingrained in our society here. It's not so much in others, but it's catching up elsewhere. And, and I've only been in 40 countries uh, or around the world. And I, I can tell you that as we take a look at uh, our national economy, our well-being, access to marketplaces, and the like, uh, it's critically important that we have internet access so that we can, in fact, make sure that somebody in any country around the world can order from Amazon or any other great American uh, purveyor of goods and services. But even more importantly, the internet is an equalization uh, mechanism for folks to have information so that they can be free and make decisions. It's, it's a cultural phenomena as much as it is a national security or a national economic. And I think soon to order from Weibo and Flipkart as well here yeah, in the U.S. Absolutely. So, so gentlemen? I, 
I won't try and predict the future around this either. I, I'll just give two data points um, that I think are relevant to this discussion. You know, one on the attack side. Um, when our government went to China and made specific points around the attacks that they were making against U.S. interests, the level of attacks went down. Um, and you could see that in the threat intelligence and the activity that was going on. So that there's clearly a diplomatic part of this that can affect level of attacks, level of threat that we face from adversaries. The second piece is there are countries, and the UK in particular is one, that is taking action at the internet network level to protect their nation from everything from uh, routing attacks against traffic that might be rerouted out of their country into other countries, uh, as well as attacks against their uh, email, <coughs> even things as simple as email spoofing um, from addresses that should be coming from within the UK. Mm -hmm. And so countries can protect themselves, and it may be easier for smaller countries than the US to do that, um, but there are proactive things that can happen. Well, Spath, this is a, a very difficult problem. I, I think the future of our security really uh, is right out here in front of us in this audience today. You know, we've, uh, I grew up in the kinetic age. Uh, I'm a child of the 60s. I was born in 1951. I just uh, went on Social Security this month, as a matter of fact. And I'm still here, still fighting the fight because it's important. And one of the things that's different, if you go back to the early 60s, we, we built something called the nuclear triad. That was the bombers, the missiles, and the submarines. The most expensive investment this country ever made. The likelihood that we would ever use that nuclear capability was extremely small, but we still made the investment. Why? Because when you look at risk, we, we talk about classic risk assessments in threat, vulnerability, impact, and likelihood. The most important thing we looked at in the 1960s is our, the asset that we were protecting was the United States of America, the, uh, our freedom, our way of life. And so we were willing to make that huge investment knowing very well that the likelihood we'd ever use that capability was very, very, very small. And the reason we did it, because the consequences of not making that investment would have been catastrophic. So you fast forward to you know, today, 2017, we have built an incredibly powerful IT infrastructure. The innovation is unprecedented, from smartphones to tablets to all the computing power, bandwidth. Unfortunately, we abandoned about 20 years ago our commitment to making that trustworthy. And it's not about policy. Policy plays a, a, a role in everything we do. But you've got to get down to what I call the blocking and tackling. That's what SPAF started doing well, 30 years ago. It's the foundation of trusted computing. And so about four or five years ago, we went back and looked at the 40 years of trust technology concepts and principles that we've developed, going way back to the Anderson Report of 1976. And we brought forward all of those in a an, NIST publication on security engineering. In fact, Greg helped us announce that at the Splunk Conference back in Washington in November. Mm -hmm. yep. Fundamental, it's exactly what you all do here at Purdue and, and Sirius. You, you study the, fun, I call it the blocking and tackling this is a computer science and engineering issue. If we were having bridges fail and airplanes drop out of the sky at the rate we experience successful cyber attacks, the first folks we call in would be the scientists and the engineers say, what the heck's going on here? But we don't do that. We kind of put IT and security in its own little stovepipe. And we have to have a national discussion soon because we are pushing computers to the edge. They're going into weapon systems power plants, everything, medical devices, pacemakers in your chest, automobiles. And we have zero margin for error now because the integrity and the confidentiality and the availability of those computers and that software is critical to the survival of the country. That's why if you're in this program, you are getting the fundamentals from the master. And that's an investment that you will never regret. And we, we, we have a tremendous shortage of security professionals, but that's a wide swath of skills. A lot of folks today claim they're, they're security experts and they can't tell you what makes a good programming language or you know, how, to, how to build a compiler or some of the things that get to, I call that below the waterline discussion. I'll talk about that in uh, the, the last hour. 
But we have to make this investment in soon. Because if you don't take care of business below the waterline, the hardware, the software, the systems, and focus on the trustworthiness there, everything above the waterline, continuous monitoring, configuring your firewall, all that stuff makes no difference. And so that's where, what we have to do. We have to just fundamentally change course. And it's going to take everybody. Well, uh, you actually touched on two things. One is, is, is kind of a, an illustration of what I was saying uh, when you gave the example of building up the nuclear infrastructure. Uh, huge amounts were also spent by, uh, for instance, the French, uh, allegedly the Israelis. Uh, the Soviet Union invested a huge amount in espionage and development and uh, found a shortcut to doing that. Uh, North Korea right now is posing a considerable uh, uh, set of questions by their pursuit of that same technology. So simply investing in the technology is not necessarily a guarantee. Uh, we actually have to go a little bit further in developing some of the norms, perhaps, that, mm -hmm. that we haven't done as, as well in developing as we might. Um, some of the work that Chris Painter, for instance, at, at State has been uh, trying to do to develop norms of appropriate use. Uh, but um, the second thing you touched on, I think, is an interesting one here, particularly for uh, potentially the students and some of the instructors and, and the audience and some of the people who hire here, is the changing nature of the field. And it has led to some interesting changes as well in how we address security. When some of us uh, uh, learned of what we were doing in computing, we were able to actually cover the entire field of computing uh, during the time of undergraduate major. Uh, there were enough courses we were able to take compilers and architecture and operating systems and automata theory and database, and that was pretty much everything we needed to know for the whole field. Now we have a field that is so large that a faculty of 100 doesn't even begin to cover all the areas. And our students are being pushed by potential employers to get through uh, an undergraduate major, and maybe the closest they ever get to the machine is learning Python. And as you were saying, uh, David, during your talk, they don't actually understand anything about file structure or disk because everything is an object in the cloud. So how do we go about dealing with security when we no longer have uh, people learning computing fundamentals and the vast majority of employers don't pressure institutions to teach the fundamentals? How do we go about, well, what do we do about that? Is there anything we can do? Or that you can suggest we should do? So any of you. So, so just to tackle this first, I, I guess I, I'm feeling old now um, <laughs> because, because I, I got a classical computer science education uh, at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. And I feel like understanding how the systems actually work is actually really important. Um, and I, that is very different from getting a job writing software today. Um, my brother, who went to Tufts and got a uh, political science degree, couldn't get a job, six, took a six-week programming class, and now he's a consultant writing software and has been for the last 15 years. That's the level of expertise you need to learn how to write Python code, maybe not to be the best Python code developer in the world. But when it comes to security, you know, there is the administration, the writing of code that is fairly simple to actually understand the risks that we face um, down to the fundamental levels of security, down to, as you were talking about, you know, trusted computing down to the hardware levels and how those things may interact with each other, it does require a pretty comprehensive understanding. And there is a very, very small pool of people who actually understand security at that deep level. I mean, we have about 500 people at Tripwire. The number of really core security experts that drive our company forward is you know, probably you know, less than a dozen. Um, and that's typically what you would see at any large security company these days. People who really understand it, really know how to move the state of the art forward, is not primarily what the industry is about. Um, so that's my take. You know, from my perch, uh, I'm sorry, Ron, I saw you leaning in. There. No, go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a geek, I'll admit it. I, you know, if you go and you take a look at minute 56 of Star Trek Wrath of Khan, Kirk says clearly, you know, it's important to know how things work and why. And unfortunately, we've been focusing too much on the app layer and the OSI model as opposed to the whole stack. Um, our adversaries are not. Uh, you know, for the last 15, 20 years of my professional career, we've been duking it out with some really nasty people on the internet. And the really good ones 
are not the ones who, you know, cut their teeth with uh, Visual Basic and just stopped and you know moved on from there. The the folks that we are up against who are um, leveraging their skills against our country and against our friends and against our way of life, they're investing the time to understand how things work and why. They are understanding and mastering all layers of the stack. Uh, they are understanding how the physics works down at the chip level. Uh, you know, the really good ones are out there in volatile memory because they know how things work. It's important for all of us to recognize that we do have to invest to understand how things work because others are, are making those investments. And I think in many cases, and I certainly saw this in the military, when we were doing military training, we used to go all the way down to the basic physics. And it just, it, it, many people went to cut it because it was too expensive. It meant the educational process took longer, which meant more expense and the like. I think it's important to uh, get back to basics in many places. It, it is important, and I, I've thought about this problem a lot. In fact, this is one of the things that does keep me up at night about trying to figure out how we get out of this partly technological jam and partly policy, and, and just a, it's a societal issue about uh, who, who, what we invest in and what we value. And you know your point, Spaff, about companies, and um, we have great companies, great, great innovators. We, we innovate better than anybody. But yet, um, <clears throat> making that investment, I think it's going to take um, a national level focus, uh, maybe from the White House on down. I can't think of how you do this without actively engaging government, industry, and academia. And the only thing I can think of in my lifetime, well before many of your lifetimes, uh, was the, the great space race when uh, President Kennedy said back in 1961, very famous speech, we were in a, a hot missile race with the old Soviet Union. We were behind. And he made a speech to the country and said, we're going to go to the moon and do other things uh, before the end of this decade, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. A very, very famous speech. It was motivational. Mm -hmm. And what he did at that point in time he activated the best of what we do in this country. We, we bring together the best and the brightest in government, industry, and academia. And we were able to put a man on the moon in less than eight years. We, we've been trying to do two-factor authentication in the federal government for 10 years and still can't do it, right? <laughs> so that, that just goes to show you how far we've come in this kind of downhill slide. And I think it's going to take something like that to engage industry because industry we had this discussion 20 years ago with the old um, Orange Book and Trusted Product Evaluation mm -hmm. Program. Many of you might, might have been around during those times when we had this vision of building trusted operating systems. Yep. We actually built one example of a trusted OS in every one of the classes in the Orange Book from the lowest level of assurance up to the A1 level, which is the highest level of assurance. We actually had worked examples from industry. What we didn't do is go back then and force the government people to buy those trusted yep. products. So what happens in industry? Well, the, the, the military commanders were calling me asking for waivers. Hey, this operating system has been evaluated, but there's another generation that was just produced by the same company. We want the newest version. So you, know, you don't say no to a three or four star general or an admiral. Those waivers ended up crushing that program. <laughs> More than once. You say once, but that's usually it's it, how you ask, Ron. Exactly. It's all about but, how you ask. but the point is, uh, we planted the seed, but we didn't follow up. We do that a lot in the government. We start these wonderful initiatives, and then we abandon it. We don't. We don't have the ability to put our nose to the grindstone and see it through. And that decision in 1996, the, the government abandoned its trusted product program for the most part. We still do NIAP and some of the things under common criteria. But it's not a concerted effort. And I asked the Navy captain in 1996, I said, sir, this is back when I was uh, just out of the military, what do you do if commercial industry doesn't produce the level of trustworthiness in those products that we're going to be using? And he never had an answer. Because there is no answer. No. So you know, we've got to be able to motivate this. I call this the essential partnership, government, yeah. industry, and academia, with a big challenge a national challenge that goes to the heart of our future. 
of economic and our national security. Because if you look at what's been going on in the last five years or so, they've basically emptied the national treasure from the F-35 design documentation to everything in OPM. I'm not sure, I know some of you might have security clearances out there. All of my top secret clearance information is now safely in the hands of somebody else. And maybe it's safer there than it is with our Well, it our cuts folks. down. Don't you don't have to fill out everything for a visa now. Exactly. Yeah, so. they already, just say C, whatever you already have. <laughs> yeah. but, Hashtag sad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the sad part of this whole story is that we know how to solve this problem. We know how to do yep. better. And we just have to get the right people in leadership positions. Everything in our business really comes down to leadership, governance, and accountability. Yep. If you've got those three things, everything else is easy. We can solve the blocking and tackling. We have the best scientists and engineers on the planet, and they know how to build trust technology, thanks to a lot of the work that uh, SPAF started three decades ago. <laughs> Keep reminding me of that, and I'd, yeah, I, that's you, okay. So it's in a good way. You, yeah, you talk about way. getting social security, and then three decades, <laughs> and oh my gosh. Um, well, uh, um, actually, uh, I have a couple comments to yours, and then I have follow-up question for for all of you. But uh, the first comment uh, is, this actually is perhaps an international challenge, and if we think of it in those terms, if we only produce something that's trusted within the U.S., we're going to close off markets to a lot of other places. So that's an, an interesting additional challenge is to build uh, components that can be with moderate or, mo or no effort trusted by, by others across different boundaries. Uh, that's a little bit different way of thinking about the problem than maybe perhaps some of us have up till now. Uh, the second one is you mentioned the effort to put man on the moon. Um, I, I think many of you out here with a little bit of web search can easily find where they're claiming that that was all a hoax. Um, in fact, anything that occurred in the news was a hoax. Uh, uh, it, was, it was fake news, according to some people. Uh, and that makes it very difficult as well to, to try to establish some norms and, and otherwise. Um, so I, I, I have as a follow-up to this a driver that has appeared in some markets for security in, in recent memory is, is privacy. And there are some who claim privacy is dead, and, and others who say it's just changing. But I, I see that as a driver. Let me also say, if, if any of you have some questions you'd like to pose to the panel, just come up to the microphone, and I'll, after they've answered this round of questions, I'll, I'll pick on you, or I'll come up with another one. So uh, anything that you want to say to the privacy issue? Well, I'll jump in on that, because I have a great deal of passion on this. You know, frankly, uh, as, as we were taking a look at trying to define strategy, uh, the cybersecurity strategy. One of the first things I did as the federal chief information security officer is, is I, I defined the, the mission. You know, everybody wants to know where you're going and what it's going to look like. And uh, the mission statement was very short. Uh, our mission, if we did our job right as cybersecurity professionals in the federal government, was to support an open and transparent government that protects the people's information, and I always capitalize the people because that's the way it is in the preamble, while preserving privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. I think that we have got a, um, a dramatic need here within the United States to have a very open and public conversation about privacy, <laughs> civil rights, and civil liberties when it comes to our information. Uh, Europe has some very significant legislation uh, that's going to take full effect uh, next year. Uh, I know that uh, my friends in the financial services sector, for example, are all over the privacy issue because of where Europe is going. But frankly, here in the United States, I don't see this as having the same level of fervor and attention. And you know, I've got children who are in their uh, 20s. They don't really have the same interest in privacy as people of my generation, our generation. You know, your privacy is now um, undergoing some changes when it comes to big data analytics. And then every time you go and freely give some information, you need to think of where's this information going to go. And uh, I don't think a lot of folks are doing that anymore. I don't think people are giving it the same level of attention or thought that they used to. And once you fr uh, freely give up your privacy and you surrender your information, getting that genie back in the bottle is increasingly difficult. 
so I think we need to have that public conversation here in the United States. Well, I think the, the architecture that David laid out this morning, uh, we're talking about people building for the cloud and, and yeah. having the, the, the store outside, uh, the numbers that I've seen from companies, and you know, you have a perhaps better, better hold on this than, than I do, is that for many organizations that collect data, it, right now it's <coughs> cheaper to add more storage than it is to spend the time and effort to go through and clean out the old and incorrect data. Yep. And so they just keep adding to whatever they've got, they keep storing it wherever it is, and as a result they do the big data analytics with potentially incorrect information. Um, so does that kind of match up with what, what you're seeing in the marketplace as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the, the bigger issue for consumers, and I talk to a lot of large organizations that are holding a lot of consumer data, is consumers have fatigue of their information being stolen now. I mean, it's how many times can you steal my name, birthday, and social <laughs> security number before it's close to public information? Maybe not fully public, but any adversary you know, probably has gotten it multiple times, and now they have to do their own correlation of all the different ways that they got my personal information. Um, and so I think people have lost an expectation of privacy because of all of this data theft that's gone on in certain areas, especially around things that retailers would have. I think people haven't quite realized where that's headed around detailed healthcare records and healthcare information. Um, you know, I, I think people still feel like there's a level of privacy, even if there's been some insurance breaches, it hasn't been to the point where I can look up someone's name and find in a database somewhere uh, every prescription drug you've ever taken. But that's, the that's kind of the next frontier of what I would expect we're going to have this fatigue around of all of the personal information that you felt like really was still private for you and now what happens when that gets breached three, four, five, six times and you realize that's not private anymore either. Um, and so I, I do think we're, we're in this cycle. Organizations care about it because of disclosure laws, because of regulation, because of compliance, um, because of the cost of losing the data. The cost of a data breach is significant enough um, and has been driven up by things like disclosure requirements that organizations pay attention to that and try and protect the data. So there are things that, from a government policy perspective, we can do to create more cost associated with not protecting that data properly. Uh, and that will improve things to an extent as well. Well, privacy is every bit as important as security. And in fact, it's so important at NIST that about four years ago, in our update to 800-53, our control catalog, many of you know that document, we actually added an appendix for privacy controls. And we're getting ready to release uh, after about a year's worth of work. Um, we were supposed to release on March 28th, but the document 853 Rev 5 uh, was supposed to be out in March. It's, it's in a slight delay now. It's at the White House being reviewed. We took all these privacy controls and we did a full integration of privacy throughout the security control catalog. In essence, we have a privacy engineering group at NIST now that works alongside with our security engineering group and we've recognized there's such a tight coupling in these two disciplines. They come from different legislative authorities, Privacy Act of 74, FISMA, but yet there's a, a common overlap. If you think of a Venn diagram, there are certain things on the security side that the privacy folks don't care about and vice versa, but there is a common overlap. In other words, you can't have good privacy without having a fundamental underpinning of good security. You have to have those systems, and that has to start at the system level. So we've gone through and done a full integration. It's unprecedented. There's nobody in the world that's done this that I know of in any control catalog. And what it's going to do, it's going to move the privacy folks into the same team as the security team. And they're going to work as a unit now. And I think one of the big failings in our security business over the last probably two or three decades, we've isolated security into its own space. We have things like security authorization or certification accreditation. We think of security in its own stovepipe. And that's why it's been so hard to bring those requirements and those controls into the boardroom because they're operating in their own little space. We talk to each other all the time. We have great rallies, and it's like the football team in the locker room, and you try to go out and the door's locked. We have to get security integrated into the life cycle from day one. Mm -hmm. And that's what our special pub 80160 uh, does. If you haven't looked at that pub, I was yeah, go download it. It's on the web, 800-160. Mm -hmm. It brings security requirements into the trade space. So they become part of every other type of requirement. And you negotiate requirements in cost, schedule, and performance terms. That's what risk management really is. 
when the warfighters want to build a new weapon, they want everything. But then they get into the cost schedule and performance aspects, and you have to do trade-offs until you get to something that's fit for purpose and actually works. If we don't get security and privacy into that discussion, it's never going to happen. So that's what we're trying to do at NIST to push that from, from inside out. So a comment that uh, um, uh, we actually heard in both of your keynotes, uh, um, David and Greg, uh, had to do with people. And one of the things several years ago I heard Dorothy Denning talk about was how at the turn of the century, AT&T was talking about growth of telephones in the country. Um, not this century, the prior century that uh, we sort of grew up in. And, was, and uh, Bell uh, Laboratories was saying that by the end of that century, at the rate of growth of telephones, everybody would have to be a telephone operator. You know, you saw they had the plug boards, they were sitting there and putting wires in uh, to keep up with the demand. Uh, and this was viewed as a crisis. And yet, that's a ha actually what happened by the 1960s, 1970s. Everyone was a telephone operator. They looked up in a telephone directory, they punched in a telephone number, and they were connected with their calls. Uh, we also saw uh, another example of this where interfaces were developed differently. Uh, the M1 Abrams. Um, I, I had an opportunity to drive one of those. Great fun. Uh, it, it's been developed. It has three controls on the dashboard. That's it. Start, shift, and fire extinguisher. Everything else is, is a steering wheel like uh, um, on a motorcycle. Uh, and it's really easy for someone to just drop in and teach them how to use it. Very, very simple. That addressed the need that it took too long to get people trained up or they weren't interested in doing it. The number you cited this morning was we're going to have a shortfall of over a million people in security by the end of the decade. Is there a middle ground here between what Ron was talking about, about the fundamentals of blocking and tackling, what you were talking about, really understanding a computer, and also being able to have an interface that most people can use? You don't have to answer that. I just, it was a long question. I, I've got some thoughts on it. Well, I, I, I saw you were thinking about it, right? Thank yeah. you. I think what we have uh, here is a quality problem. And, you know, frankly, the, the shortfall in security is uh, basically a shortfall in folks trying to fix stuff that's delivered generally uh, in, in poor quality to begin with. That's um, kind of a controversial view. But if you look at it from, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Deming's, uh, you know, TQM uh, type yep. of approach or Malcolm Baldrich uh, view of it, Really, we got, you can make the case that we've got a quality issue. And if we built in quality from the beginning, we wouldn't necessarily need so many security folks to try to clean up the mess on aisle six. I think that there's a case to be made to um, make a bigger investment in building in security from the start. Which is what Ron was saying. Right. And, uh, and then from there, we can buy down our risk of not having enough manpower to clean up after the fact. Look, you know, the best example I can use is the automobile industry. When I first, my first car barely had a seatbelt. And then over time, they offered optional airbags. And when I was a young second lieutenant, I had to make a decision if I wanted to have an airbag or an A-track. And I chose the A-track because second lieutenants are bulletproof. But over time, the automobile industry, combination of regulation and free market innovation, we came to what I call the balance point. And there, there are some automobile manufacturers produce some of that stuff because they want to make safer cars. On the other hand, they start out to be optional. And we've moved our way to seat belts, airbags, steel <coughs> reinforced doors, and now a bunch of computer driven safety features that keep you from changing lanes and falling asleep. And eventually the car is going to drive itself to wherever you want to go. The question is, when you buy a car, they don't say, here's your airbag, go install it in your garage. They're, they're, the balance point to me is, industry has a responsibility to build in some of those features and trustworthiness, the assurance related things that we need. And then we still have a responsibility, like when you drive a car, you have to go take driver's ed, you're not supposed to drive while you're drinking, and all the things that are just good from a user point of view in that automobile. But you still rely on the manufacturer to bring you a safer automobile yeah. and bridges that we drive over and airplanes that we fly in. Why should this be any different? 
You know, but it is. Yeah, you missed the panel earlier. So that self-driving car will drive you where someone wants you to go, maybe exactly. not where you want to go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, just, just to add to that, I mean, I think a lot of this complexity and the skill shortage that people see is around the idea that there are these 60 different categories of security controls and security vendors out there, and I do need someone to deploy, operate, and manage all of these different things that are there. Um, if you're a small organization, you know, people are actively moving to things like managed services approaches mm -hmm. and outsourcing and people who can get economies of scale from doing this for you. If you're a large organization, this is a very complex problem because the heterogeneous set of devices, applications, and networks you're trying to protect is very, you know, it's very sophisticated. It's not a one size fits all. There aren't people outside of your organization that generally can even understand your infrastructure. And then you layer that on when you talk about big companies, they're constantly going through uh, mergers and acquisitions. They're adding new parts on, which had a different set of security products. And now my whole challenge is just trying to reconcile what did this company have with this company and how do I get a consolidated view? And you don't look at a lot large government organization and you have those same challenges of trying, you're, you're not trying to secure one thing, you're trying to secure 60 different large networks which are all not all that well consistent on how they've been built up, how they're operated and managed. Yeah. And maybe that can add a little security by having it not all unified, but it adds a whole lot of complexity. Standards in the technology, which Ron will talk about later. Mm. Um, John. Yes, uh, so I, I want to kind of throw out a thought process and see what your reaction is. I work for a company called Analog Devices. We're one of the largest providers of essentially taking the analog world and turning it to a digital world, connecting this, the physical to the digital, right? And you know, as we're in the marketplace at the edge, what we're seeing is that it's more than security. And, and security, I think, is a paradigm that is becoming maybe old. Our customers want uh, data integrity, data rights management, privacy, the ability to provide to the, 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 the folks a value proposition they're willing to pay for, right? What we see happening is security becoming commoditized in many respects, so we need to drive a different value proposition. I think the other issue is it's about data, and it's becoming more and more as we're getting connected about developing outcomes by connecting things and combining things with the advances that we're making in measurement and sensor technology that we haven't had in the past. And that's creating big challenges. So we talk about privacy. We're introducing technologies that you can put on a bicycle that with low, low acoustic imaging we could detect your heartbeat with low radar. We can actually see and predict within two weeks a high risk person in heart attack. We can, we're putting out a scale that's going to give you your oxygen saturation level, pulse width, all kinds of stress level. So the issue becomes, is that private? Our Fitbits that we're starting to put in place. So now the insurance companies, the life insurance companies, the telematic systems in your car, our insurance rates, our premiums, all of these things are going to be very much tied into stuff that before we could never imagine was going to be used to determine certain things in our life that we would say is private, to your point. Mm -hmm. And we can't address those with traditional security. Right? We've got to find ways to secure it at the edge, to somehow provide some sort of privacy in the data itself, and bring that up the stack in such a way that we can. So I think those are some things that are emerging fast, and the feature capabilities that they're trying to drive from these things are getting them into the marketplace before a lot of the issues that we're talking about are being addressed, and nobody's willing to pay for it. So in some respects, the government, I think, has to start getting involved in some of these areas to drive industry in a direction to make the investments and address some of these issues, you know? Yeah, so there are two or three things in that. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, John, that's where, really where I was uh, trying to get to, but you articulated a little bit better than I did from the standpoint of I think that we need to have that open public conversation as a people as to what are, what are those thresholds that we want and where do we want government to come out and say, here's where the lines are and, and frankly we don't want to stifle innovation either, but at least we need to define what we value and how we want to protect it. 
And I believe that that should not be done necessarily from a bureaucratic approach, an administrative approach, but rather a very open uh, and public discussion. And that should be codified, I believe, in legislative action where the, the Congress, as the oversight mechanism, directs the executive on how to implement the, uh, certain things. But that's based upon what the people of the United States want. And I think that's the conversation we need to have as Americans. And I hear everything you talked about in terms of security maybe being less relevant as it exists today. And what I heard was just security is even more important than it has ever been. Yeah. Um, that, you know, if you're, a, yeah, if you're a device manufacturer, you're making embedded systems, you have one view of how you need to secure that piece of it. Um, and a lot of what we talk, often talk about security is the operational security of, okay, I'm you know, network security or I'm securing an organization. But that is only one piece of this more complete puzzle you need to think about. Um, I do think large organizations and governments have purchasing power uh, and the ability to push their vendors and manufacturers to do things. I do think consumers have a harder time um, actually being able to push a consumer-oriented manufacturer to actually build security in. And so I do think there's a reasonable public argument around at the consumer level what should be the standards and how should people build things for personal privacy. I think that's harder for uh, a company or someone to enforce or perforce. Yeah. yeah, I agree with all of that. I, I think that there's two points here. We talked about this balance point between complete regulation and complete free market innovation. There will be a balance point that will come out of a national dialogue because when you start to produce consumer items like cameras or DVRs or home routers that can be weaponized by our adversaries. It happened last fall with the, uh, the Krebs uh, website attack and two-thirds of the internet going down because those home devices, the default password wasn't changed. Those things, that, that changes the whole nature of the discussion now because now innocent consumers have no idea that the products they're buying are being turned around as weapons against people and organizations. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is the fundamentals haven't ever changed. I have this discussion over and over again. We had it when cloud first came out and when mobile came along. People said, well, where are all your new security controls for cloud and mobile? I said, look it, the fundamentals haven't changed. It's the, I call it the, it's the physics of computer security haven't changed for 40 years. Mm -hmm. How we apply those in small form factor devices, like a smartphone or a sensor, there'll be some differences. But after all, we are still pushing computers, those finite state machines, to the edge. And those computers are being driven by firmware and software. Now, there may be instances in devices where we, like on a smartphone, we, we had this issue with two-factor authentication. People didn't want to carry around something <laughs> other than the smartphone, so we had to develop something called derived credentials which are placed on the actual device. Now, that, that may seem like a good solution to the average consumer out there, because they only carry one thing around, but how trustworthy is that credential when it's, it's in an untrusted environment? An operating system on a smartphone may be totally untrusted. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to Greg's point about, we have to care about the entire stack. And today I see most people look from the application level up. They, they ignore the middleware, the operating system, the integrated circuits all the way down to include the supply chain. Okay. Yeah, it's an application layer and then PFM the rest of the way. <laughs> uh, we'll, do, we'll do one more from the audience and then, uh, and then a wrap up. A few minutes, uh, Jim Christie from Valparaiso University, a faculty member. A few minutes ago, uh, one of you said that we, what we need is a, um, this grand effort where we all, col where these, the, the, the Trinity collaborates, that is government and industry and academia on, um, on working together to develop this effort at um, security and secure environments and trusted computing and so on. And there's been, um, as I see it, there's been a tremendous amount of collaboration between, gov uh, excuse me, between industry and academe, and that's evidenced right here uh, with this institute and things that are going on in my own university. But then I think about government, and I see the inability of, um, of the legislature to pass anything that doesn't fall entirely along party lines. I mean, how, can, how, how is it that we've gotten to a point where, where all votes are on party line? And in that environment, there is no collaboration that goes on. There is no discussion at a national level, really. There is uh, 
whatever the Republicans propose is wrong because we're Democrats, or whatever the Democrats propose is wrong because we're Republicans. There is no collaboration. And so it's, it's that process the government the, of, of the government that's broken because people will line up along party lines and not be able to discuss the, the real issues. So my question is, is there really any hope for that grand vision that you had. I saw all the panelists just nod. There, there is hope. But is there hope? There, there is hope. I, and I, I take all your points. And anybody out here who's watched the uh, uh, political scene for the last couple of years understands exactly what you're saying. However, I'll tell you, from, from I've been in the government a long time. I had 20 years in the military and now 20 at NIST in between a little private sector time. Security has always been a bipartisan issue ever since I came to NIST. And we briefed the congressional committees on both sides. Now, having said that, to come together on a grand initiative, there may be some partisan politics that it gets, in, gets injected at that point. But I'll tell you, the Republicans and the Democrats have looked at this issue from our perspective as pretty neutral. Everybody is subject to being hacked. Nobody wants to be hacked. Everybody has an interest in making sure our, our economy stays strong. And in order to do that, we can't be bleeding intellectual property with, with all these cyber attacks that we continue to see. Our federal government, writ large, has had some of the worst attacks ever, from the Snowden incident uh, to the OPM incident, uh, and it goes on and on and on. So I, I am very hopeful that this particular issue uh, will, will have bipartisan support. Uh, it may take us a while to get there, but at some point, people look around and say, you know, this affects all of us, and we have to come together at some point for the good of the country, and hopefully, We'll be able to do that, but what you say is, is very true. There's a, a lot of truth to what you know, what you're saying. And I hope we can change it. Do you, gentlemen? Well, I'm pretty passionate about it, and I agree with what Ron said about security. But um, you know, from my perch, uh, a couple of things. First of all, um, let's not give up hope. We still have the best government and uh, construct in the history of mankind. Our Constitution is a fabulous document, and I wish more pe people read it. I pledged uh, my life and honor. I wore the uniform for 38 years, and if you throw all the cadet time I had in there, uh, I'd still be wearing the uniform. Uh, and I can still fit in it, too, by the way. <laughs> well, um, who's the fact checking here? Who's the fact checkers at? <laughs> come, come to Arlington on May 5th at 3 o'clock. I can't Barry fit in mine. I'll, I'll fess up. I can't fit in my uniform yeah. anymore. We're, we're burying my uncle. I'm putting the uniform on for him. <laughs> Good for um, we, the people, are responsible. It's not the pinheads that we uh, elect or the, the bureaucrats that are beaver in a way, you know, in the different offices. We, the people, are the ones who are, bear the ultimate responsibility. And if, if we think that we're in a spiral down, it's up to we, the people, to pull back on the stick and get things right. You know, if we take a look at our government, it, it was created by some, um, some folks who thought ahead. And there's checks and balances. And if you think of this as a business, and, and we're getting our clock cleaned by the competitors, what do you do? You take a look and you reassess where you're going. Are our core principles Solid, darn right they are. Constitution's great. But we got some stuff that we got to sit back and have that very public and open conversation. We the people are the stakeholders. We're the shareholders. If we don't like what the board of directors are doing, let's go get some new board of directors. If we don't like what the C-suite is doing, let's get a new C-suite. You know, ultimately, we all share that responsibility. And if we don't communicate to the people that work for us in the government to set the priorities that align with what we want, then we're not doing our job. And that's where I think that as we talk about where our priorities are and where we want to be, that we need to, as citizens, vote in the legislative process, but we also need to vote with our wallets and how we invest and the like. I don't give up hope because I think that we, you know, having been in those 40 countries, there's so many people who want to be American because of the Constitution, not because of, you know, the commodities that we produce. It's the ideas and the hope that we give. That's my view. Thank you. 
Yeah. Anything to add to that, or can I? I think that was a good, uh, okay. good segue. <laughs> so, so I'll say, as a, as a scholar of history, um, if you look back in the U.S., about every 35 years, we undergo certain national traumas. Uh, they're always different, but trauma that causes us to change and develop a, a new attitude for the way that we embrace government. And one could argue that we are undergoing one now, or maybe we haven't quite gotten to it yet. Um, I, I, I agree that uh, there are times where things look bleak, but as a population, we do have opportunities to uh, change course. We're, we're almost to the end. I've got one last question uh, for the panel. Uh, and I'll ask you each for a 60-second or less response on this. Uh, the fact that you're all here indicates you haven't given up hope, because otherwise you'd sell everything and move to the North Woods and live off the land. Um, <laughs> but uh, the near term is, is certainly uncertain. Wh what do you sort of see as the progression? Is the next five years going to get better, worse, about the same? Um, uh, just a, a sort of a quick view here for especially the students who are about to go out in the workforce. Ron, why don't we start with you? I think the next five years uh, will there'll be a little little downturn before things get better, but I think the the job market and your career you've chosen a fantastic career, and I think uh, if you just get the fundamentals, get you know you invest in those fundamentals now, and those will take you a long long way, give you the confidence to withstand the ups and the downs. But long term, I'm optimistic we will get this right, whether it comes out of the Congress or the White House or just the groundswell that Greg uh, just talked about, the citizens rising up, being good consumers, good citizens. That's all of our responsibilities. And you, you are investing in your future. And I want to thank every one of you for doing that, not just the students, but the faculty as well, and all the folks here from industry. It's a great country. We will get this right. I asked a similar question to a group of financial services CISOs. And I think 95% of the room was pessimistic about the next five years around <laughs> cybersecurity. Um, and uh, I tend to listen to our customers because uh, that's part of my job. And so I similarly am fairly pessimistic about the short term. Um, we're going to continue to have breaches. The complexity of organizations is continuing to grow. And nothing is fundamentally changing with the way that we're operating that's going to reduce that. At the same time, you know, you can use a lot of different analogies. But the idea over the long term, are we going to stop breaches? No. Um, are we going to solve security? No. Um, but will we get to a point where we have a sustainable way of managing risk for large organizations? Um, yes. Um, and we'll be able to be more effective at dealing with that risk, to understand what that risk is and how we, how we can make the decisions to invest to um, be that, find that right balance for each individual company. And so I do think it's going to be a long-term process of continuous improvement that's going to get us to a better place. I don't think things are fundamentally changing in the short term. I, I'm actually bullish on uh, the next five years. First, I think the Cubs and the Red Sox are go both going to win again sometime in the next five years. <laughs> uh, couldn't say that 20 years ago, could you? Uh, I, I think, though, that we are operating at a greater risk exposure than the general population uh, uh, understands at this point. I, I really do. And I think it, uh, the next big cyber incident is going to be centered around critical infrastructure. And it's going to make the Ukrainian situation and Shamoon and Saudi, it's, those are going to pale in comparison. Uh, and I think that's going to be a wake-up event for a lot of folks. And uh, that will fundamentally move the cheese. Uh, I think that as we take a look at um, the cyber norms that my, uh, my good friend, our good friend, Chris Painter, has been uh, leading on, if you haven't taken a look at them, uh, take a look tonight. You know, get on your browser, type Chris Painter, and then cyber norms, and the four norms that we have been promoting uh, internationally. I think they will be accepted formally. I think it will go through not a bilateral process, but a multilateral, multinational process. And I think that will set the stage for a, a greater uh, international conversation on cybersecurity, risk management, privacy, and some other matters that I think are intrinsically linked to the integrity of the, um, the world economy. 
because we are all globally linked together. I think that you're also going to see greater um, uh, attention paid to uh, supply chain when it comes to both hardware and software. And I know that my friends in uh, the manufacturing sector have been uh, addressing that already with uh, greater on-site surveillance in manufacturing processes. But the surveillance on the software manufacturing process is something that I think we're going to see some growth in uh, between uh, the suppliers and uh, the, the requirement, uh, requiring organizations. So I think that we're going to see a lot of subtle but profound uh, issues. I think we're going to have some wake up moments because of uh, some incidents that are coming. And once again, you know, I'd like to uh, foot stomp. I think that we all have a stake in making sure that our voices are heard as far as what our expectations are, both in the marketplace as well as the legislative and governmental side. So I think there's three things here to wrap up with from the panel. The first is those of you here, uh, a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities. Uh, this is a great field to be in. I think all, all agree to that. Second. It's fairly clear that our, our uh, three experts here all have a very different conception of what 60 seconds means. <laughs> <laughs> Who's closest? <laughs> and uh, the third conclusion is that there is hope for the future. You don't need to move out into the wilderness and learn how to catch your own food unless you really want to. Uh, but uh, to take advantage of some of those opportunities. And please take advantage of this opportunity to thank the panel. Thank you.